Mm, good evening. Welcome to the uh, Copernicus Festival lecture by Professor Julian Barbo. Um, you're invited to think of any question that you may have because in about 60 minutes there will be a short period to do that and ask some questions. So please welcome Professor Julian Barbo. It's a, it's a great honor to be here, and I, I love the experience of being in, in Krakow, uh, one of the most beautiful cities I've ever visited. I, um, I just would like to uh, say something. I have wonderful collaborators. They are uh, listed here with various papers. Uh, uh, if you want to follow that up, you, you can do so. I think this is going to be online later, so you can, you can follow it up if you really want to. So let's get uh, straight down to business because serious matter. Now, I'm gonna, I've got a conjecture, and that conjecture that I want to consider is that the timeless laws of geometry are the origin of time, structure, and beauty. An important thing that I forgot to put on the slides is that the laws by themselves are sufficient according to this conjecture. No special extra conditions are needed. So the first timeless law is geometry. Galileo said that he that attempts natural philosophy without geometry is lost. Geometry holds the world together. It dictates how things relate to each other in space at one time. These shapes here reflect uh, a deep truth. They represent the three possible structures of space itself. It can be either have positive curvature, flat, or negative curvature. The simplest possible structure in a flat space is a triangle. It always has 180 degrees. Now, I've forgotten to take my triangle. So wherever I hold this triangle in, in, in the spatial framework of this room, those angles, 180 degrees, remain the same. They, they don't change wherever I do it. And moreover, the shape of the triangle is fundamental. It's fixed by two internal angles that, uh, that then tell you what the shape is. But uh, so the, size, the shape is fundamental, but size is not. As I hold a triangle like this, and move it forwards and backwards, it looks smaller and larger to me, but its shape has not changed. So that tells you that the shape is something very much more fundamental than the size. I would say that angles are absolute, you can't change them in any way, size is relative. The second timeless law is dynamics. It tells us how the structure of the universe at one time is related to its structure at another. These two quantities here uh, tell us the, uh, how rapid the change is, and this tells us how, what the magnitude, well, that, that's determined by this quantity on the right here. Now, it's a direct consequence uh, uh, the, this law is timeless because its form is the same at every instant of time. That, that form never changes. And that explains why energy is conserved. It's a direct consequence of Hamilton's beautiful equations. They're beautiful because of their symmetry, simplicity, and universality. There are so many processes that they govern. Another key fact which I should have put on the slide is this. To use the dynamical law, that's it there, you have to know the dynamical state at some time. You need an initial condition. That's going to be a very important thing. So, there's a long-standing 
outstanding problem at the heart of physics. All the known laws of nature, including the dynamical law I just showed, are time symmetric. You can run them forwards or backwards in time. They make no distinction between past and future. But all the processes we observe in the universe have a common direction. It's called the arrow of time. It's the subject of my talk. In fact, there are several arrows. The one that touches us most personally is the passage from birth to death. Why are the past and future so different? We all get older in the same direction. We never meet anyone getting younger. Getting older is universal. Astronomers have observed billions of stars and know how they evolve. They are all getting older just like us and in the same direction as us wherever and whenever you look in the universe. The arrow of time first became an issue for scientists with the discovery of the second law of thermodynamics and entropy. In a closed system, entropy cannot decrease and it generally increases. What is more, it does that inexorably, just like we age. Intuitively, entropy is a measure of disorder. You may have seen pictures like this. Initially, all the atoms are in the small box on the left. That's a relatively ordered state. Then the walls of the small box are removed. The atoms soon spread out over the big box. You can wait far longer than the age of the universe. The atoms will never go back spontaneously into the smaller region. There is an obvious reason for that. The atoms move randomly and are trillions in number, so it's highly unlikely they will ever go back where they were. In this example, the arrow of entropy increase exists because the initial condition is much more special than the final condition. Ludwig Boltzmann made heroic efforts to understand entropy. Nobody has bettered his definition of entropy in terms of probability, but he failed to give a good explanation of why it always increases. What is it in the vast profusion of nature's transformations that creates special initial states like the one we just looked, like, looked at? You might say, we put the atoms in the small box, but what put us here? Boltzmann's life is a tragic example of a malign arrow. He suffered bouts of depression and in one bad one, hanged himself. As Shakespeare said, and time that gave doth now his gift confound. The growth of entropy in a closed system leads to thermal equilibrium or heat death. That made a huge impression on scientists when they realized the fact. The general public were affected too and it contributed to the fin de siècle gloom at the end of the 19th century. Heat death of the universe seemed an awful prospect. It was Arthur Eddington who coined the expression, the arrow of time, in 1928. What he said then is often quoted. The law that entropy increases holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. If your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. 
There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Few scientists disagree with that, but what is the origin of entropic necessity, and is it supreme? I'm going to question that. I will start by suggesting that the belief that entropy rules all may have something to do with the way it was found. It all goes back to the brilliant young Frenchman, Sadi Carno, a very sympathetic man named for a Persian poet in vogue in the Napoleonic age. Sadi was fascinated by steam engines. In his book, Reflections on the Motive Power of Heat, he showed engineers how to max maximize steam engine efficiency. The best you can do is given by this expression. T1 minus T2 is the difference of the absolute temperatures of the hot steam you use and the cold steam when you have attracted, extracted the maximum amount of work you can. Sardi showed there's a limit to that. The first law of thermodynamics says energy is conserved. You cannot get something for nothing. Carno showed that even if you have something, hot steam, you cannot use it all in any process. It's the truth at the heart of the second law. You can get something out of something, but not all of it. That's forever thwarting engineers in the most diverse situations. But before taking this further, I'll show you two more arrows. We have all thrown a stone into a still pond. That disturbs the water at the point of entropy, but soon we see the beautiful outgoing waves. This is an arrow that goes from disorder to order. It's not a malign but a benign arrow because the same effect predicts the transmission of radio waves and allows us to watch television. In fact, if you are watching this when my talk goes online, this is the arrow that carries me to you. There is still a mystery. The equations would allow it, but we never see waves coming in from the banks of the pond and converging in the middle. Now I come to the master arrow that rules all arrows. Hold your breath. It's the Big Bang. It suggests that the whole universe came out of nothing. Was King Lear wrong when he told, said to Cordelia, speak again, nothing will come of nothing? The NASA timeline tells an amazing story. Strangely, it seems to run counter to the second law of thermodynamics. Near the Big Bang, the universe was very disordered, like a choppy sea. But then structures began to form, and we get the formation of stars, galaxies, planets, and ourselves, to say nothing of Krakow. Where is the growth of entropy hiding? Well, it's within every galaxy, every star, and every one of us. What the universe creates, it also destroys, slowly perhaps, but inexorably. Time that gave doth now its gift, his gift confound. For all that, when you look at the big picture, it's a story of the growth of order, not disorder, at least up to now. The master arrow includes the accumulation of our memories and creates the sense we have of our identity. That's very precious. Can we understand how the universe does it? Before we turn to that, look again at the picture. 
Can you imagine anything more asymmetric? Nothing here, profusion here. And we believe it is described by equations that give no hint of a past or future. Is it something to do with a special condition, initial condition there? This, I think, may hold the key. Carnot studied the behavior of steam in a cylinder. That's what's now called a thermodynamic system. By their very definition, all thermodynamic systems are confined. They are in some kind of box. But is the universe in a box? That seems a very strange idea. The universe is expanding seemingly forever. If so, is it confined? It's unconfined. I think theoreticians may have created the problem of time's arrows by being conceptually conservative. They have not thought to take away the swaddling clothes in which entropy, when born, was placed with loving care. It's time for potty training. We need to conceptualize differently. First, let's be clear about the meaning and significance of confinement. Experimentally, you have a gas in a box. You can control the heat flow into and out of the gas. You can measure its pressure, volume, and temperature and change them in a controlled way by adjusting the position of a piston very slowly. Using the results of experiments made in this way and what he learned from Carnot, Clausius proved there must be a further subtly hidden characteristic of the gas besides the pressure, volume, and temperature. He called it entropy and found its change ds, the S facade, it seems, when heat dq is added and the pressure is changed. T is the absolute temperature. Soon, Clausius, Maxwell, and Boltzmann developed the kinetic theory of confined gases by assuming they consist of trillions upon trillions of molecules rushing around in all directions, bumping into each other, and crucially, the box walls. In barely a decade, they created the kinetic theory of heat as due to motion. It's a universally applicable explanation. As Maxwell said, all heat is of the same kind of them, of the same kind. The three of them created a scientific revolution. Maxwell was a genius. He also created the theory of electromagnetism and with it that of light and radio waves that, in one way or another, here or online, bring what I am saying to your eyes and ears. Now, what is the theoretical picture that emerges from that kinetic theory? The natural tendency of the molecules to escape and fly off into space is thwarted by those box walls. This leads to what is called Poincaré recurrence. The gas is nearly always in the maximal entropy state of thermal equilibrium. That's heat death. But there are always tiny entropy fluctuations and very rare deep dips separated by times immensely longer than the age of the universe. In fact, Nietzsche's idea of eternal recurrence is realized almost exactly. In virtually all cases, the system returns infinitely often, infinitely close to all the states in which it once was. However, the spans of time in between are incredibly long. It is a bleak picture. As T.S. Eliot said, 
ridiculous, the waste, sad time stretching before and after. This gloomy picture has a feature you may not have noted because my collaborator, Flavio Mercati, put this arrow indicating the direction of time, pointing as usual from left to right. But the entropy curve looks the same from right to left or from left to right. Reversing Flavio's arrow, making it point the other way, changes nothing in the overall picture. It is utterly unlike that asymmetric picture of the Big Bang. As part of his heroic project to explain entropy growth by statistical arguments, Boltzmann came up with a, uh, an idea that has captured the imagination of theoreticians. I quote him. He assumed the universe is and rests forever in thermal equilibrium. Then only near deep entropy dips are worlds where visible motion and life exist. The direction towards the more improbable state will be experienced as the past. Now, so this is, near these dips, this is the only place where living beings can be. And these ones here will think that's their past, but these ones here will think that's their past. It's quite a striking idea. Now, there's a really key ins insight here. Time has no pre-existing direction. It's not a one-way street. Entropy growth, said Boltzmann, puts the experienced direction on the world's timeline. So only here do you have a direction of time. Boltzmann's view is now standard. Stephen Hawking says so. Boltzmann's attempt to reconcile the time symmetry of the dynamical laws with the arrows of time has very largely determined how people think about the issue. That's summarized in this slide. So Boltzmann uh, and uh, some people today think there was a huge fluctuation from thermal equilibrium in the direction we call the past. I won't go into them, but this idea has severe difficulties, so it fell out of favor. However, the notion of the multiverse has led some theoreticians to revive the idea. The majority today believe the universe must have begun in the Big Bang uh, with a very low entropy. That's why it can be, still be increasing today. Both of these ideas are a form of what is now called the past hypothesis. And that is, the arrows of time are not due to the law, but to some very special condition in our past. Both of... Uh, this, is, this is not an explanation. It's an admission of defeat. It means modern science fails to explain the most profound aspects of our existence. Now for my idea what the real explanation could be. It starts with the simple idea that the universe is not in a box. We then soon see that in an unconfined system things look very different. Now, I apologize for this, but the next two slides are the most important in my talk, and they're not going to be exactly easy. Please bear with them, and then if you're struggling and it, when it goes online, watch again, and then you might get it. So, the simplest model that gives the idea actually gave Newton, Isaac Newton headaches, so you'll be in good company if you're struggling. That's, uh, it's the problem of three particles that interact through Newtonian gravity. That's like the Earth, Sun, and Moon, but all alone in space. To eliminate any effect of Newton's absolutes, a pre-existing time, and an, inverse, an invisible spatial frame, we insist that only the angles which fit 
which fix the shape of the triangle which the particles form at any instant, play a role in the dynamics. Then only solutions with vanishing energy and angular momentum are allowed. The form of all such solutions has been known for a century. The motion unfolds in a plane, or on a plane, like, like the, the surface that you see there. The trio's center of mass rests in the middle. In the infinite past, one particle moves on a straight line at uniform speed towards the oppositely, oppositely moving other two. Those two orbit each other around their common center of mass in the beautiful elliptic motion that Kepler discovered for the planets. Unless the masses are equal, the ellipses will have different sizes, but the two motions are, complete, are in complete synchrony. When the Kepler pair gets close to the singleton, there is a brief but violent interaction involving all three, perhaps with partners swapped, as here, with red for blue. So here's red come down here and paired up with green, and there's blue going off there. The two parts move uh, apart with ever, sorry, um, the outcome is always the same, whatever happens in the middle, there's always a Kepler pair and a single particle. The pair becomes ever more perfectly Keplerian, and the two parts move apart with ever better uniformity. Overall, it's a transition from order into disorder and back to order. It's only because we have such a powerful sense of time's advance that these arrows don't look suspicious. If you reverse them, the story's hardly changed. Not identical, but it's still a passage from order through disorder and back to order. That's the time symmetry of the equations at work. It is odd. Imagine the Kepler pair, a boy and girl, dancing towards a boy, still looking for a partner, who, when he meets the pair, manages to waltz off with the girl. Her ex leaves the dance floor feeling very sorry for himself. But now reverse the arrows and he's the one who pinches the girl. It's a fishy story that can be turned upside down like that. Now I'm going to deconstruct that story and give it a different interpretation. This might look postmodernism a la Derrida, but I believe, I myself believe there is one true narrative and not that one story is as good as another. First, I'm going to talk you through the original story using the successive triangle shapes now shown at the bottom. As I said, shapes are fundamental. They are all we need for a model universe. You see how the same basic story unfolds from left to right as from left to right. This needle-shaped triangle here uh, is, corresponds to when the singleton is there and the Kepler pair is out there. They're much closer to each other than the distance between them. So you see that in that needle-shaped thing. When you get when you get this triangle, the singleton has got to here and the Kepler pair to there. And at the equilateral triangle, they're all together in the middle, dancing around each other. And then you go out, and it's the same story on the side. This triangle here, the Kepler pair is here and the singleton is there. And when we get out uh, to here, the Kepler pair is, is there and the singleton is out there. So you see how that goes. Now, we're going to follow Boltzmann and add a direction of time only when the manner in which things change allows us to do so. Let me say that again. We're only going to add a direction of time in accordance with the way things change. 
then we can say we have a direction of experienced time. We get something like Boltzmann's entropy dips. The central region is uniquely distinguished. In both directions away from it, order represented by the growing perfection of the Kepler pair increases. We can interpret each diagonal separately as a history which begins in chaotic motion and then goes over into perfect order. So from this chaotic motion, there comes the singleton out, there goes the Kepler pair. That's getting ever more perfect and exactly the same story is unfolding in, in that one. So, uh, so we've got this possibility of describing each diagonal in this way if we follow Boltzmann's trick of saying we only put a direction on time's arrow if we can see something changing properly. And this interpretation is like the optimistic myth of order created, created out of chaos, but with a twist. The order is created in two opposite directions of experienced time. The time symmetry of the equation is uh, reflected in the solutions. Uh, you see it there. Note too that we invert Boltzmann's arrows of order into disorder and heat death. For us, the disorder becomes order. We don't have the pessimistic twin myth in which the golden age decays through bronze into an age of rusting iron. We also see how time is created by law. Geometry gives us the triangles. In this model, they are both instances of triangles and instance of time. The dynamical law picks out one particular infinitude of them. Even if we found them jumbled up in a heap, the continuous change between them would enable us to put them uh, in order like movie stills cut from the spool one by one and thrown together. Nothing in the story is destroyed by that. We can still play the movie. The, uh, the triangles, by virtue of what they are and how they differ from one another, place themselves on a timeline if we like to imagine it is there. It does not add anything to the facts, but allows us to survey them, to grasp their totality. That's what scientific explanation aspires to. In fact, the law creates much more than the mere order of time's instance. It allows us to add time intervals uh, and spatial dispositions to the, uh, to the triangles. As the Kepler pair tends to perfection, it becomes three things all at once. A rod measured by the diameter of the ellipse, the axis of the ellipse, a clock, and a compass. As the Germans say when they want an excuse for another beer, all good things come in threes. The rod is the long axis of the ellipses. That of the particles, that of, the particles of the Kepler pair uh, trace out in perfect synchrony with each other. The clock ticks once each time uh, an orbit is completed, and the direction of the axis defines a fixed direction, true north. Relative to this miraculous all-purpose tool, the singleton tends to ever more perfect rectilinear motion. We even see the toy universe expanding at a definite rate. The pair and singleton get further apart as measured by the pair's rod. There is no hint of this exquisite order that emerges out of seeming chaos, but the equations say it is there. And no special condition has gone into finding those solutions. All of the solutions look like that. The thing that stands out most clearly in the model I've described is that if you use the Newtonian description in which there is an external scale, there is always just one point at which the system has the minimal size. Now, in fact, I think I won't go into giving you the mathematics for that because uh, um, 
Those who are mathematicians here, they can probably work it out. But basically, at this point, the system always has a minimal size. And we call that the Janus point because it uh, divides the solution into two halves. And the, the two halves look in opposite directions of time, just like the Roman god Janus does. So the, uh, the name Janus point for that unique minimum of the size is very appropriate, as you see in this beautiful Roman coin. Janus is the god of doors and of beginnings. He looks in two opposite ways at once and has a, has a unique central point in the middle of the heads. It's not too difficult to find Janus point systems like the one I described. Just like that system, in them all the solutions apart from a so-called set of measures zero uh, that we can ignore divide at a unique point. The two heads of the coin illustrate the situation almost better than one could expect. Each head is basically the same, but if you look carefully, different in detail. The faces are not quite the same. Moreover, each half of any solution of such systems is asymmetric, just like each head here. The tousled hair in the middle is like the uh, chaotic motion, but then we come to the two eyes and the nose. Uh, that's a bit like the two particles of the Kepler pair and the singleton soon after they have separated along either diagonal. To get the full effect, the nose would have to grow like poor Pinocchio's. I'll leave you to imagine that. Here's another example of a Janus point system. I said we always see outgoing waves and never ones that converge back again. Einstein said, that would require statistically most improbable initial conditions coordinated at the banks of the pond. But suppose we had an infinite expanse of water as a model universe, and that at some time the water is everywhere flat except in a finite region of compact support, as the mathematicians say. Then all the solutions would look like this. It's just like really what we were looking at with the three particles. It's another Janus point system. Now I want to come back to the issue of size as opposed to shape. The expansion of the universe counts as a great discovery. But in fact, we don't see the universe expand. We observe ratios and interpret their behavior as evidence of expansion. Hubble observed redshifts and said the universe is expanding. But redshifts are ratios of wavelengths. Easier to see are galaxies. They have an average diameter, and at any given time, they have an average separation between them. And saying that the universe expands, that's really a way for saying that this ratio is getting smaller. Only dimensionless ratios have physical meaning. Let me just make that point again. Shapes are all we need. What counts is the triangle shapes. They are defined by the ratios of the side lengths. Here's another important slide. This is going to involve a little bit of abstract imagination, uh, but I, I, I'd like to show it to you. This triangle exists in space. However, there is also an abstract space of triangle shapes. Each point on this sphere represents one particular triangle shape. So this point here, say, represents that triangle, that shape of that triangle. Not its size, but its shape. So, so, and every single point there corresponds to one of the possible different shapes that triangles can have. You can play this game with any number of particles. With four, you have a space of possible tetrahedra. But only for triangles can you make a picture. That's because 
two triangles fix the uh, the shape of the uh, two angles sorry fix the shape of the triangle and the shape is represented here by the uh, longitude and latitude coordinates they take into account a weighting of the particle masses in this case taken to be equal the points with the same longitude but opposite latitude are mirror image it represent triangles that are mirror images of each other the equilateral triangles are at the north and south pole there are six special points around the equator these correspond to uh, situations when all three particles are on one line. Uh, in, in this case, one particle is exactly in the middle between the other two. And then as you go from here to here, that corresponds to the particle in the middle coming and sitting on top of the one on, on its side, so that two particles are essentially either very close to each other or literally on top of each other. And thus you see the whole of the space of possible triangle shapes uh, uh, on top of each other. I will now explain this color coding. We know intuitively the difference between a very uniform distribution of points in space and one in which there is clustering. I want to express that mathematically in a way that depends only on the shape, not on the overall size of the distribution. I need a ratio of two lengths. Then their magnitudes will cancel and leave only something that depends on the shape. There are two distinguished lengths. One is called the mean square length and the other is the mean harmonic length. Now the mean harmonic length is typically, for us here, if we were the particles, it would be the average distance between any pair of us taken by chance. So basically it's about half the diameter of this, half the width of this room. So that's the mean square length. And then there's the mean harmonic length and that's here, and this has got the, the, the separation between the particles in the denominator. And that means that if any two particles get very close to each other, that causes the, means, uh, the mean harmonic length to change a lot. So if any two people here started to kiss each other, that would change that thing quite a lot. Um, so, um, so you take the ratio of those two things and it gives you some quantity which is very sensitive to clustering. That's because as I walk around here, or if one of you were to get up and walk around, it would hardly change that root mean square length. It hardly changes the average separation between all of you here. However, uh, as I said, if two of you start kissing and cuddling, that will already change the mean, square, uh, the mean harmonic length quite a lot. So you get a very sensitive measure of clustering. And this is reflected in the color coding. At the equilateral triangle, that what we call the shape complexity is at its minimum. Here there are saddle points there on the equator, and here the complexity rises to an infinitely high peak when the two particles get close to each other. So at this point I come to the end of my prepared text, and I'm going to go on, uh, and the translators will have to follow me uh, as I go, but they have had some advance warning of what's coming. Now, with that complexity, you can actually see the Janus point. There's the solution I talked about at such length. But here we have, so here is the size of the system, which is growing and going through a minimum there. That's basic, this quantity here is its slope. Here it's negative and there it's positive. This goes up there. But both of these things depend upon being able to see the size, but we can't see the size, we can only see ratios. So the only thing that is actually visible is this complexity. And you see, it's, it's remarkable. This is what inhabitants within the universe can actually see directly. And they see this complexity changing. Now, the, uh, the fluctuations are because the Kepler pair is, is typically formed, in this case, with a large eccentricity. So the two particles are sometimes closer to each other and sometimes further apart. And I said getting closer to each other and moving further apart when it's just two changes things a lot. So that's the origin of these fluctuations which become very regular. And they, they, they go up, they rise like that because that third particle is escaping. So that's a measure in some sense of the overall size. So uh, that's, that is what is happening. And you see how striking it is. Uh, so again, you have one past and two futures. So, and those fluctuations that we see, 
that disappears when we have a thousand body simulation. This is the result of calculations done by a collaborator we had. And you see those curves are smoothed out because there's now so many particles. Two people kissing over there are not in phase with two people deciding to get up to mischief over there. So uh, all of this is going on and it, it uh, averages out. So, uh, but you see there's a very clear trend again. So this, this huge asymmetry, and again that is all just out of the equation. Nothing whatever to do with a special condition put in because every solution has that. And so this is an artistic pressure down here. In the middle, all of those uh, particles are swarming around like a swarm of bees in, uh, flying around in nothing, all moving in random directions relative to each other and a fairly uniform distribution. But here, as you go out here, clusters form, structure forms. Uh, so you get something that is qualitatively different. Uh, now, I think I'll miss this except to say there's a very fundamental property in Liouville's theorem uh, which says, well, I will say it for the, for the mathematicians and perhaps people watching this later online. Uh, there's something about Liouville's equations which says that the phase space, phase space volume must be conserved. Now, that's for the total system. If the scale part grows, the shape plate, plate part must decrease, and that means there are attractors on shape space. Let me show you that more in terms as a picture. So here is, I think we'll omit that bit of the story. Uh, here is that uh, solution we saw before, but now you see it as a curve on, on the shape space. So you might just be able to see it, but in there there's a little white X, which is the Janus point and the two arms of the solution. One is coming, that's one diagonal coming out this way, going around there, and the other diagonal goes around the other way, the yellow curve, and they are forced to go to one of these peaks here. This, they, wherever you have the Janus point, and whatever direction the solution starts in, they will always finish up at just one of these three points at the top of that peak of the complexity. So absolutely fixed, there's, there's no getting away from that. So I think this is a very profound reason uh, at the base of uh, the arrows of time. So uh, the great question is, is the universe confined or unconfined? Well, I'm suggesting that if it's unconfined, we might have a very natural explanation of the arrows of time. So here's Poincaré, and if we, if we have a confined system, then we have that Poincaré recurrence, we have this constant alternation of disorder and order, but these vast stretches of time in between. Uh, if we have a Janus point system, then we, we do get a sort of a, a, a dip or a U-shaped thing, but there's just one point, instead of there being infinitely many uh, places of order and disorder, there's just one place of disorder and then it grows to order in either direction. So uh, that's a very striking difference. And it's very deep in the equations. Uh, so now what is the Big Bang? Well, I'm suggesting that NASA only gave us half of it with this, this timeline. Now let me say this, there are definitely a caveat here. This is not yet proven. My collaborators are working on this and it's looking quite hopeful. Now what happens in the Big Bang in the, in the conventional story is that the universe appears to have exploded out of nothing to have minimal size. The volume of the universe is zero here and then it grows to infinity. But if you only count the shape and look at what the shape is doing, actually it, we're pretty confident that we can show that you can go through this point because although the size goes to zero, the shape just is, is perfectly continuous. So if you only looked at the shape, you would, you'd, you'd, ha you'd have a job to tell, actually you were going through the Janus point. All you would notice is that at that Janus point, the motion instead of being nice and regular as it is out here with nice structures, it's like that swarm of bees flying around in nothing, as I said. That would tell you that you're going through the, uh, the Janus point. But imagine just the shape of a swarm of bees swarming, there's nothing particularly outrageous about that. Just take out the size and that's, that's all that may be necessary, we think. So uh, I think I'll miss that. I, I, I just will say that if we're on the right lines, I think our theory might be able to make quite strong predictions about the universe. Uh, it's to do with, well, I will say a little bit, sorry. 
Um, the situation is this. We seem to have an idea that we know what the law of the universe is like, but we have no idea what solution we might find ourselves in. That, that is in nature's hands. But uh, the great French mathematician uh, introduced something which is called Laplace's principle of indifference. If there are n possible outcomes of some process, you know what the process is, but you don't know which outcome you're going to get, then the only rational thing for a gambler to do is to give equal probability to each. So you, in, our, in our model here of three particles, it's like a blindfolded creator throwing darts at shape space, and they will land completely randomly anywhere on the surface, just in a, according to the, the, the area that's there. Now, it's obvious that few darts will land on the high complexity spaces but many more will land where it's uniform. And if you increase the number of particles, then that effect that darts thrown at random will land where the universe is, is, is uniform is very, very, becomes very, very pronounced. And this suggests that the universe should be very uniform at its Janus point. And if the Big Bang is a Janus point, then the universe should have been very uniform there. And that's what observations tell us. So that's one of the things why we're a bit hopeful. We might be on the right track, but this is still early. Don't take this as being true yet. What I said about the Newtonian solution with those three particles, the difficult part of the talk, that is true. The, the mathematics there has been known for 250 years. Uh, but. Uh, what, uh, what we're suggesting for general relativity is still, problem, uh, is still not yet cut and dried. And in addition, there are all sorts of issues with quantum mechanics. So uh, I think we can explain th where the second law of thermodynamics comes from. You need to distinguish an entropy for the complete universe. The complete universe is something quite different from subsystems within it. It's not a steam engine. It's not the steam within the cylinder of a steam engine. So this suggests that if there is an entropy like quantity for the universe, it should actually decrease and not increase. Because here we have disorder and here we have order. So we have formulated that. That's in a paper that I showed you at the start. Uh, and we actually call that entaxi from a, a Greek coining meaning towards order. So the universe as a whole is getting more ordered in our picture, but then it forms subsystems. And once subsystems are formed, they confine themselves. Like the steam in a steam engine, the, part of the, the stars in a globular cluster or in a galaxy, they are confined by the gravitational self-potential of the system. And within that, they will start with some value of the entropy and then the entropy will increase. So we think we've got the outline of how the second law of the dynamics arises out of dynamical necessity. There must be a second law of thermodynamics in every universe and within subsystems it will increase even while the overall structure of the universe is getting more uh, ordered. Um, so actually, you know, let's go back to Sadi. Um, I don't think we need worry about that work that Sadi did. Uh, steam engines will still work, and, and you have to make them as efficient as you possibly can. Now, I, my talk was um, the origin of time, structure, and beauty. Now, of course, you, you're all familiar with that incredibly beautiful planet, Saturn. I don't know how many of you have seen this picture. This was taken by the Cassini spacecraft when the sun was behind Saturn. It was an eclipse of the spacecraft. So you get this incredibly beautiful picture. And modern science is perfectly able to explain using Einstein's general theory of relativity and with that as yet for them inexplicable initial condition that the universe was very uniform at the Big Bang and we're arguing it must have been very uniform at the Big Bang, then if you put together that picture with quantum mechanics, science seems to be perfectly capable out of those two timeless laws of geometry and dynamics to create this incredibly beautiful structure. I think that's quite impressive. Now, is, is, is the future optimistic? Are we going to have heat death and things like that? Well, there's a, um, 
there's a competition going on between the universe, up to now at least, getting more structured, and entropy within its subsystems, including us, uh, getting greater. And uh, so the universe is, is, its future is uncertain, and have we any chance to defeat aging and so forth like that. Allow me, if I may, as, as a passionate lover of Shakespeare to, to read his sonnet 60. And it's all about minutes, so that's why it's 60, you see. So, like as the waves make towards the pebbled shore, so do our minutes hasten to their end. Each changing place which that, with that which goes before, in sequent toil all forward do contend. Nativity once in the main of light, crawls to maturity, like me, wherewith being crowned, a crooked eclipses against his glory fight, and time that gave doth now his gift confound. Time doth transfix the flourish set on youth, and delves the parallels in beauty's brow, feeds on the rarities of nature's truth, and nothing stands but for his scythe to mow. And yet to time in hope, my verse shall stand, praising thy worth despite his cruel hand. So all that Shakespeare is allowing for himself and his lover is that his words will survive. But in heat death, nothing will survive at all. So that's, that's the, uh, the problem. I often discuss death with my mother near the end of her life. And we both agreed that actually mortality is actually what gives meaning and beauty to life. If you lived forever, it would be dreadful. But uh, it, it's the fact that your life is finite. It, it puts a frame around the picture and you have to work hard to make something beautiful in the middle. At least that's my philosophy. So is the hope in affinity, but is the hope in affinity? Leibniz said we live in the best of all possible worlds. But what did he mean by the best of all possible worlds? In his monadology, he says his system is the means of obtaining as much variety as possible, but with the greatest order possible. That is to say, it is the means of obtaining as much perfection as possible. Now Leibniz had two possibilities. Either the universe was eternally perfect, or it was striving to perfection. So we've seen something a little bit like that in the three-body problem. Now, real numbers can encode an infinite amount of information. And in saying this, I'm anticipating, I hope, the discussion with Professor Gregory Chaitin and, and uh, Virginia Chaitin and Michelle Heller afterwards. Um, is it perhaps the case that infinite Janus point information encoded in real numbers is unfolded in time. Is ever finer structure revealed? So we start off with some random uh, initial state at the Janus point. We know we get to Saturn. Will it go on forever, this, this increasing structure? Uh, well, from quantum mechanics, we have an argument that it might, that, shall we say, interesting structures are, are picked out in, in ever finer detail in ever smaller regions uh, in accordance with our tentative theory of, of the quantum mechanics of the universe. Now, Plato said that time is the moving image of eternity. We would suggest perhaps that time is the ever finer illumination of eternity. Let's go back and just have a look at Saturn again. There it is again. We've gone from chaos to that. This is a much more detailed, this wonderful fine detail there. So I'm going to allow myself to end with what I think is, is the, one of the most marvelous passages in Shakespeare's uh, works, the Mid Midsummer Night's Dream where Bottom wakes up and finds he's been abandoned in the wood. When my cue comes, call me and I will answer. My next is most pear firmus. Hey ho, Peter Quince. Flute, the bellows mender. Snout, the tinker. Starveling, God's my life. Stolen hence and left me asleep. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream. 
past the wit of man to say what dream it was, man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. That, of course, is wonderfully ironic. It's just what Shakespeare has done in the play. Methought I was, there is no man can tell what. Methought I was and methought I had. But man is a, bat, is a patched fool if he will offer to say what methought I had. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen, man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it has no bottom. And I will sing it in the latter end of a play before the Duke. Peradventure to make it more gracious, I shall sing it at her death. Well, I can't sing. I've done my best. But the point I want to make is Bottom's dream. I think Shakespeare must be saying there's infinite depth in the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I, I guess we will have questions. Um, is there anyone who wishes to begin? Yes, please. Two questions. What happens to energy at the Janus point? And Sorry, the, what, happens? what happens to energy at the Janus point? And the second question is, uh, what's your idea of order? Or definition of order. About? Of what's your definition of order? Of order. Yeah. Of order. Um, the energy is in that Newtonian model. The energy is exactly zero for all time in the Newtonian representation. So energy is 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 in that model. If you take out Newton's absolute time, the only way of of describing it without an absolute time is to have the energy exactly zero. Um, Energy in general relativity, Einstein's theory, is, is a difficult concept to define, but I think some sort of analogous effect would happen there. And order is, in the first place, we define it by that complexity, because that is, that is a, a, a measure of, 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 of structure. That is definitely, when that complexity is high, there is definitely structure. If instead of everybody sitting there, you were all to get into groups of five and six and four and then separate out into groups like that. That would clearly be a more structured situation with ev compared with everybody sitting here. Uh, and it would be just the same as with a swarm of bees. So that at least is one quantitative measure. And in fact, that entropy is very interesting, uh, that complexity. It's very interesting, that complexity is, is not quite the Newton potential. The Newton potential uh, does two things. It causes all the particles to be pulled towards their common center of mass. But that's something which you cannot observe within the universe inside. It also changes the shape of the universe. And that's what, uh, that's what inhabitants of the universe will observe. So in fact, if you ask, what does Newton's theory tell us about what is actually observable within the universe, it seems to be a theory almost, if you like, constructed to create structure in that sense, uh, which, as far as I know, that hasn't been observed. I mean, uh, this occurred to me, and I put it to people who work in these problems, and they said, yeah, I think that is one way of thinking about it. it it's, it's very surprising. But another way with structure is, is that Kepler pair forming, because the orbital elements get ever more, the, the, the precision of the orbital elements gets settled to ever more uh, decimal places or, or binary digital places as time goes on. So that in a sense is order. So, and those, that Kepler pair, they're actually going around on two different ellipses of different sizes, but as they get further out, they get ever more perfectly synchronized. Now a, a clock, you can't define a single clock. A, clocks are only useful if they march in step with each other. It's no good me wanting to meet a girlfriend whose clock doesn't run at the same rate as mine, or we won't meet. 
So clocks have got to go in step. And you see that exactly happening. Each of those particles in the Kepler pair is becoming ever in better synchrony with each other and, 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 and defining useful clocks. So perfect order is only coincide. Think about it. So perfect order is only coincide. In fact. They, they, they never hit each other. They, I mean, they, I, they, but, in the Newtonian picture, they always remain at the same separation. But like, but in your picture, like, is, because the question was, uh, is the perfect order when they coincide in a sense, in a synchro? Well, it's hard to say it because I mean, in your model, is uh, well, because you're saying that perfection happens, and then what would that mean in your model? The the. That point where I said they're sitting on top of each other is just a mathematical representation. What that, what that means is actually the separation between the two particles compared with the distance to the third is getting ever smaller and smaller. That's all it means. In the Newtonian representation, those two particles in the Kepler pair, they never collide. They just go on. Observers looking at each other uh, sitting on the, each of those two Kepler particles, they'll, they'll still see the other, the other guy going round in the sky, so to speak. Um. Um, can, can I kind of intercept? Yeah. Uh, so would that point correspond to the singularity? I mean, mathematically and cosmologically, the point where these three coincide wouldn't be the classical singularity? Uh, the, the three... The three there are solutions in the three-body problem where all three particles collide at a point. That's called total collision. Now, I've discussed this with n-body specialists, and they think that the Newtonian theory breaks down there, just like general relativity is thought to break down at the Big Bang. However, I then pointed out to them that if you just look at what the shape is doing, it just goes perfectly smoothly through the other side. So all of that crazy behavior that you seem to have in the Newtonian picture is just not there if you look at the shape. It, it, and it, it's, uh, so it, it, it's just a completely different way of, of thinking about things. And people have just not stood back far enough and said, we are inside the universe. We must try and Im imagine what it really is like. Does size have any meaning? These famous, if we're on the right track, these famous singularity theorems of Penrose and Hawking, it might say they actually don't mean terribly much because the shape is perfectly right. Interestingly, Roger Penrose now is actually talking in rather similar times, but he doesn't have a Janus point at all. He has just, it's like a, a long chain of the universe. He has a universe which, which expands and then suddenly it gets much smaller. He doesn't really explain how that's going to happen. Actually, the law of the universe changes and then it goes on again. So it keeps on having bangs like this. So his solution is hugely asymmetric in time uh, and it changes the law of the nature uh, of, of the universe. But he too thinks that at the Big Bang, the, the, the shape goes through continuously. Um, so, but our, in our situation, it's, it's utterly simple. We just have the two halves of the solution and it just goes through. So that point I wanted to say, that point where the, uh, the Janus point, it's not a bang, it's a door. It's a door into the other half of the solution where experience time is opposite to ours. So it has finite size. No, it doesn't have, I think to say it has any size is just meaningless. The, the only, all you can talk about is, is the separations between, the, the reason we can think that we have a certain size in this hall is because the walls are there. But take the walls away, there's no, there's no measuring rod outside. Um, anyone? Okay, then allow me. <laughs> because I, I was wondering about one thing. Um, you, you stressed very highly that, the condi that at, at any conditions the situation will occur. So in the, uh, in the scenario where you had the pair, the orbiting pair colliding with this singleton, well, isn't this a kind of special case that you already begin with a close orbiting pair colliding with a singleton? I mean, if you take all the possible free body configurations, only a small subset of them will have a close pair colliding no, with is, a... No. Isn't this a, uh, a narrowing down of the conditions? Or will, will this occur for all possible configurations? 
That is the remarkable thing. It is, there's it just a very, there's, a, there's what's called a set of measures zero, but they're almost the same. This is the thing, this is the, the it's, it's absolutely amazing if you read, I've looked in lots of books where they're worrying about the origin of the arrow of time and things like that. And all of them cannot shake off three or four centuries of scientific practice where you start with some special condition, you, you know what the law is, and then you predict what the consequence will be, then you look later and see if the prediction is verified. And it started with Galileo's law of free fall. You hold a, 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 a ball at certain height, a, a heavy ball, and it will fall and it will gain speed and you can make a prediction. And he also said, if you roll a ball across a, sta a table, it will fall off the table and then it will come down in a beautiful half parabola shape like that. And depending how fast you send it off there, the parabola will be different. But the point is the parabola is always, the, is always a parabola and if you, if you look the complete solution, so to speak, it'll be the other half of the parabola on the other side. And every single solution is like that. And amazingly, the, I, I've searched and searched in all of the literature on this, the origin of the entropy and, 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 and the arrow of time. Not once have I ever seen that point made. They always just say, oh, there must be a special initial condition. Nobody has stood back and said, is this the right way to think about it? But the idea is that you would have to wait longer and longer with larger systems. So, for instance, you had a thousand body problem, and there was also this convergence of all the trajectories to this Janus point, correct? For the thousand body problem, we had the same story. Am I right? Well, yes. But, but how it, long would you have to, do I understand well, the, correctly, the answer you just is, have to wait longer for it well, to happen? Well, the answer is you should take, if I may say, you should take the whole idea of time out of this at all. You should just think of it as a picture in eternity there. When you're, when you're in that, it, 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 whatever you like, it's like going into a library which has got all the possible solutions. You open them up and look at them in front of you there, and that's what they look like, period. There's nothing more to say. But now, of course, where we are is out where a lot of structure is formed, and, and that's it there. So, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, there's that wonderful saying of Galileo about uh, the, the great book of nature, I speak of the universe which stands ever open before our eyes. But you cannot read the book unless you understand the language it is, in which it is written. It's written in mathematical language with triangles and circles and things like that. And that's in, mathematics in that way is timeless. So geometry. You, geometry or, or, or the, but the dynamical law in a sense that that's timeless as well. Uh, it's just trajectories on phase space. It, 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 you can just say it's the trajectories on phase space. And the, the, the main thing is the trajectory. Actually, time is just, well, time is created by these clocks which the universe itself creates, and they tick. But you don't have to use them if you don't want to, but it's rather obvious because they're, they're all marching in step together very wonderfully. But the, the, the uni, you can rely on the universe to do that for you. Uh, Anyway, yeah. yes. You are talking about uh, entropy and information. There is a concept of lottery principle that is lowest amount of information needed to generate one bit of information. It was in Leo Schiller paper uh, quoted around 40 something. And what is your view of a lottery principle? Because on one hand they say it is it is the, it's the fundamental connection between entropy and information to concepts. On the other hand, Lauder principle is contested. So whose principle is that? Lauder principle. How do you spell that? L-E-A-U-D. Oh, Landau. Landau principle. Yes. I, I know of it, but I've not... I haven't studied Landauer. What I have studied is this absolutely beautiful book by Shannon and Weaver on information theory and it is Yeah, yes, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and by the way, that just like Carnot's great insight with steam engines, it was solving a problem in technology. Uh, and, and I mean, it's just fantastic what has come out of that work of Shannon. Um, I myself would like to look deeper and think more about information. I've come to information theory relatively late in my life. I did write, 
you, I'm sure you're familiar with Wheeler's aphorism, it from, from bit. I don't believe it. I wrote, my essay has the title, Bit From It. <laughs> the whole comes before the part, in my view. It was an inter interesting concept, but he didn't explain it further. Thank you, Pan. He, it was an interesting concept, but he didn't elaborate on it. Yeah. In fact, actually, there is so-called Fisher information, and Fisher information is claimed is more fundamental to understanding of entropy than Shannon uh, information. Uh, just on that, the, some of these ideas are related to something which I haven't talked about at all, which is best matching, which is a way that you measure the difference between the shape of two triangles. Uh, there are, there are uh, possibly interesting things there. This is all to do with getting rid of this invisible framework which Newton imposed on our intuitions. Um, so, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and if I may suggest, we will... In just a couple of minutes, we will have a much broader uh, presence on the stage to talk about information theory. So if you have any further questions about that, I guess in about an hour, we'll probably have a much uh, more diverse voice about this. But about geometry and about, about passage of time, is there anyone who would like to comment on that in particular? Sure. Like in a sizeless universe, what happens to the notion of mass? That's, uh, well, first of all, the Newtonian notion of mass is not terribly problematic. And anyway, the only thing that counts is mass ratios. I don't know if you're familiar with Ernst Mach's beautiful operational definition of, of mass, in, mass in Newtonian theory. Because Newton Newton's is fascinating. He, he gave a definition of mass, but it's a vicious circle. Uh, but he used it perfectly correctly. I mean, this, this was Newton's genius. Um, in, in general relativity, it's all to do with the Higgs boson. And it's, it's one of the major issues. Why I say there are so many caveats with our ideas when it comes to general relativity and quantum mechanics. Uh, the question of the Higgs mass, the Higgs boson, is, is a part of that, that, that story. It's very important. Um, I can't really say more than that. Like, it, what, it, your intuitions are, is the notion sensible at least, uh, like in your model? Uh, yes, in, oh yes, I mean we, um, I would say we, we are not changing anything in the known laws. We're just looking at them in a very different way. And actually it's, I tell you what, way back in 1963 I started thinking about time. And I wrote it somewhere, I, I think I've got a copy of it, my sister typed it for me. And the title of the thing was taken from, it was about time and whether time exists. And the title was taken from the, um, uh, the story of the Emperor's New Clothes, where the child calls out, but he's got nothing on. <laughs> and you could, see the, uh, you could see the naked emperor. And it took a child to see that. And I would say, uh, some of you may have read my essay, The Nature of Time. I say, it's not really like the Emperor's New Clothes, where there is an emperor there and there's no clothes. I would say, there are no clothes. <laughs> there are clothes, but there's no emperor. <laughs> So the clothes are the triangles, uh, uh, and, and so on. So uh, it, it, it might just be just that one change of, of viewpoint. And I'm just, actually I'm rather encouraged, I'm just reading Carnot's book at the moment, and Carno says, he just says, people have not stood back from this issue of what makes steam engines work. We need to have a, a larger perspective to look on it. Uh, and I think it may be the same case. I think people were so impressed by that early work of Clausius, Carnot, Boltzmann, Gibbs, and, and, and Poincaré. All of this is superb work, but, but virtually everybody who's followed in their footsteps, it just hasn't changed the way of thinking. That was all appropriate for thinking about steam engines, but I'm not sure it's appropriate for thinking about the universe. It's basically a theory, a theory of eternity. You're, in, in some senses, yes. In, in, I mean, in a I, think, sense. I think the theoretical physicist is always inclined to take a, a God's, eyes, God's eye view and, so to speak, see the whole of, of, of history spread out 
like the Rocky Mountains in the uh, words of, um, in Slaughterhouse Five. By the way, let me tell one story which is quite interesting. When my book, The End of Time, came out, I went to Chicago to uh, address uh, the Humanities Fair. And several American uh, reviewers of my book had said my ideas were like Vonnegut's in Slaughterhouse Five, which is all about the bombing of Dresden. And it's a, it's, it's a wonderful book. And at the start of my talk, I said, I don't know if this will help, but American reviewers have said my ideas are like Vonnegut. And, and so I thought that's fine. And then on the flight home, I start reading the book, and I, I think it's very nice. Now, the, the key figure in this is an anti-hero called, um, what's he called? Anyway, he's an anti-hero. Uh, it was actually his experience, Vonnegut's experience of being in Dresden when the bombs fell. Uh, and. Um, He's captured, after, after he's come, come back home to America, he's captured by aliens in a flying saucer. And the flying saucers uh, can time travel. And for this reason, he knows how he's going to die. And he dies on the occasion of going to Chicago to address a large public meeting on flying saucers and the true nature of time. <laughs> was I glad I got to that point when I was home, <laughs> not in Chicago. <laughs> well, that's scary. <laughs> <clears throat> I think we have time for, I guess, one, one more question. Then we will have five minutes to regroup and we'll continue with the evening. So is there anyone? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I have a question. Um, because uh, Poincaré's recurrence was formulated in the, context of, uh, in the context of static space. Now, if we add to the equation the global expansion, does it hold? I mean, can we expect that actually the initial conditions after a very long time will be restored if we factor in the expansion? Even if we take this relativist, relativistic relative uh, definition that it's uh, s distance between galaxies, two sides of galaxies, so not doing it the standard cosmological way, but can we really expect that? Or does global expansion just rule it out? The, uh, the, um, well, first of all, one observation, it's quite clear to me that Poincaré did not like the kinetic theory of heat. And, and I, think it, I think he was prompted to discover his, his, his recurrent theorem because he, was, he, wanted to, he wanted to kill the idea. Uh, but the key, the key assumption that leads to Poincaré's theorem in mathematical terms is that the phase space of accessible states has a bounded measure. So the minute you take the confining walls away, that's lost. And if you read Gibbs's great book, he says, all of my theory requires two things. The system cannot go into infinite space. It must be restricted to a finite region of space and the momenta cannot grow unboundedly. And that's, again, these are the important restrictions. So does it mean that the Janus point in a uh, accelerating, expanding universe will not come? Well, um, that would depend. I mean, if, if we're, I mean, there's so many different possible types of solutions that could be for general relativity are if, if we're on the right track, then the law of the universe will be such that there is a Janus point, even if the expansion is, is increasing. And in fact, accelerated expansion, if you look at it in shape space, well, you can define that. It would mean relative to things like Kepler pairs, that the, 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 the recession velocity of the galaxies is speeding up. That would still be perfectly consistent with the picture, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you again for your talk and for your discussion, and we will continue half past. Thank, thank you. you.